Wayne, thank you so much for being willing to do this interview. And why don't we just start off with you just telling us a little bit about who you are and what you do. Well, uh, I spent 36 years in Hawaii planting churches. So I had the privilege of being part of starting 152 churches that span to um, Japan, Australia, Myanmar. We have 16 in Myanmar and uh, in Taiwan, uh, Okinawa and the Philippines, and then on the West Coast. So my heartbeat is to train up emerging leaders for the ministry, to disciple them. And because uh, I believe that, you know, tomorrow's church, the, pr- the biggest problem with tomorrow's church won't be a lack of leaders. It'll be an overabundance of underdeveloped leaders in places of leadership. And that's when the apostasy begins. So uh, I really do want to disciple up young men and women who know the word of God and are committed uh, to see the kingdom of God advance in biblical ways. Can you say a little bit more about that in that process, at least how it plays out in your life? I'm, I'm just curious, how do you view discipleship and in, in mentoring the next generation? Well, you know, I uh, noticed that one of the very first things Jesus did when he started his ministry was he chose 12, that they would be with him, he'd send them out, and he'd cast out demons. And uh, so I thought, hmm, same thing with Elijah. He started the school of the prophets, and uh, I take a look at Paul, the apostle, he's always speaking about discipling and his uh, protégés of Timothy and Silas and Barnabas and John Mark. Some ended up well, some not so well, but he was, his assignment was permeated with discipleship. So some people see me as a church planter, when in actuality, church planting is a result of discipleship because you disciple up leaders and they need to go somewhere. They need to do something. So church planting is really a result of actually a different kind of uh, desire and passion that's to build up leaders. Huh. Uh, we were talking before we, we dove into the interview and I was sharing how I've, I've been in the L3 community knows I've been going through a difficult season with panic, burnout, um, et cetera. And uh, you wrote two books that have significantly impacted me in this area. One is Leading on Empty uh, and the other is Sifted. And I wanna kind of get into both today, but especially in the world we live in today with COVID and the year that we've just had, I think so many leaders are dealing with leading on empty. And can you just start off just telling us about your personal story on why you wrote this book and what your experience was? Yeah, nobody uh, wants to enter into a time of burnout and anxiety or depression and no one plans on it. It's hard to train for it. And, uh, and it happens uh, imperceptibly. Uh, when you're somewhat of an innovative person, Doug, you, you start something, you, you, cause I'm a type A person, I wanna see fruit. And uh, it's no different from the father in John 15, 16, he says, you didn't choose me, I chose you and appointed you that you should go forth and bear fruit. He's a fruit inspector. He talks about that with the fig tree. So I wanna make sure that I'm bearing some fruit and in doing so, you everything you start, you got to run. You got to manage. You're the president. You're the pastor. You're you're the top dog on everything you start. And uh, if you're innovative uh, in somewhat of a prolific way, you can't pass off these things fast enough. And you don't want to because you can hand it off to somebody that'll destroy it. And I've had that happen three times with some with some of the ministries that uh, we began and uh, they no longer exist today because I passed them off too quickly to people that weren't ready. They had character flat spots and ineptitudes in certain ways, but they're nice people. And I found out that nice people don't necessarily uh, fit uh, in every case. So uh, I was just overwhelmed and uh, not nefarious, not because I was malevolent or didn't do what Jesus wanted me to do. It wasn't due to sin. It was simply because uh, we were innovating and and, uh, doing ministry. And I remember, uh, Doug, I was taking a jog before a conference that I was to speak at in California. And lo and behold, I find myself sitting on the curb on the street crying and my hands were shaking. And I looked at my hands and I said to myself, something's broken, but I have no idea what it is or how to fix it. So when I finally went back to Hawaii, I met with a psychiatrist friend of mine, who's a wonderful Christian, and and he said, basically, Wayne, your serotonin level has been depleted. You were running in your passion on endorphins, on excitement, on joy, 
But then when too many things start to pile up, now you've got to manage, you've got to do HR, you've got to do taxes, you've got to do problem solving. Now you're moving from your passion to something that is not in your wheelhouse. Uh, and so, but you still have to do it. It's part and parcel of everything. Now, 80% of my energy was going to this area that was not my wheelhouse and I had actually shifted. So now instead of running on passion and excitement and my endorphins and serotonin because it was filling my tank, now I'm doing something that drains my tank. And I had no idea when that switched. So now I'm running on adrenaline. I'm running on duty. I'm running on, I got to get this done. So now I am leading on empty. You can't just say, I'm done. I'm out of here for a year. You just can't do that. What would happen to the church, the people? You know, they'd go nuts. So you have to lead on empty. And lo and behold, Doug, it was a year and a half after that that I actually had a heart attack. And uh, so I was flown to Stanford Medical and they put three stents in my heart. And so still today, I've got to take a, an injection, self-administered injection every two weeks to keep my heart clear. How so old were you, just out of curiosity? Yeah, what is that? How old were you when all this happened, just out of curiosity? I was 52. 52. Yeah. And so uh, I realized that I'm frail and I, uh, I am not invincible and uh, I really need Jesus every step of the way. So change my schedule a bit. I still have that drive, but I've got to throttle that back and keep myself healthy. Because if I, if I go down, a bunch of stuff goes down. So it can't happen. Yeah, you shared in the book when you met with that psychiatrist, he also recommended taking a year off which, you know, when I read that, I'm like, that, that seems extreme. And he said, if you can't do that, you know, take off six months. Yeah. Uh, what, what did you do? And, and what would your encouragement to leaders be like if they're at that burnout point when it comes to taking time off? Because I think for even in the season that I'm in, I actually took a week off of work. Um, there's a fear that, hey, if, if I took off several months from work, you know, I don't know if I'd ever go back. Like, I, I feel like there'd be such a void. I mean, can you just speak to that? I'd, I'd just be curious what you learned from that. Yeah, uh, I had been in ministry for about 23 years at that time. And, and somewhere between 18 years and 25 years, people will go through that dip. And um, I don't know if it's just biological, but they're, they're going to face that. And you need to take off time as much as you can uh, so that you just first heal. And the second is that you... Um, stem any further damage to your psyche. So basically you've just got to arrest that. And then even when you come back, you have to reverse that. So it'd be nice to take a year where you stem it and reverse it before you come back. But that's not always the case. But if you can recognize, realize it, have, be in some counseling and uh, in a advisory group so that they can watch you because Often I say this way, you know, the eye cannot see the eye. Uh, if you need if something's wrong with your eye, you got to have someone look at it for you. So that's where uh, a rescheduling, a rebalancing of your life comes in, uh, but not a lessening of the passion. It can't be a lessening of your call. Some people just bail out on their call and go from an A plus a disciple to a C minus disciple, and they think that's what God wants. He does not. He wants you to stay as an A plus, and that includes balance. And that's what I had to find out. Huh. Um, I, I am curious, you know, can you talk about, you obviously had to experience physical feelings to understand that something was wrong. Um, Kerry Newhoff has a great book called Didn't See It Coming. And I know that was the case for me. It sounds like it was the case for you. Is there anything leaders can do, you know, to actually see warning signs that, hey, if I don't change something on the front end, I'm going to experience what Wayne went through, what Doug's going through. Uh, you know, how do you tell the difference between, hey, I'm just tired as a leader versus, hey, something's going to end up not in a great place if you don't change something? Yeah, you, everyone gets tired. But a lot of times, you know, with a night or two of good rest, you, you're, you're bouncing back. Now, when you're going through burnout, a night or two of rest doesn't bounce you back. Uh, you go through anxiety uh, problems. You get short of breath, you can't clear your lungs, uh, you think you're going through a heart attack, and you can't, uh, your brain doesn't work quite as well, and you start moving into the slippery slope of depression. And so I went into a, a clinical depression. I had to have medication to get me back out. It was a pretty bad slide into a deep valley for me and found myself, you know, cringing on the floor of my office in a fetal position, crying 
and uh, it was just too too painful. But uh, Doug, you have to remember that <clears throat> even though it's a tough season, do not be afraid of it. If I could give you a pill or every pastor a pill or leader a pill to avoid that, I wouldn't do it. Because you see, your plate might be this big and you're operating here and you've got to be able to find the edge of your plate or your potential, uh, your capacity. So what is it? And if we're so afraid of the edge, then you may live your whole life way beneath the potential that you really have. And you'll never find what your potential or capacity is. And the only way to stretch your muscles is stretch them, is bring it to a fatigue. So if you're a weightlifter, you know that there's a thing called uh, you lift and do reps unto fatigue, muscle fatigue. Then that's when the smaller cells break down, bigger ones are built, stronger muscles result. So there's a plate that you have, if I could do that, uh, share that. And you got to get to the edge of your plate. Now, when you feel the pain of it, that's when you need to make some adjustments, not before. So don't be afraid of the pain. Do you have children, Doug? I do. I, do. We, I have a one-week-old boy, and I have uh, two, two girls, so three kids. Wonderful. And, you know, when your children start growing, um, when do you buy new shoes? A year in advance? Uh, when they're half-fitting and they're getting three-fourths of the way to the end of their shoe? No. You buy them new shoes when they say, dad, my feet hurt. And then you know it's time to get them new shoes. Uh, life and growth in life is like that. You're gonna come to points or the edge of pain. And you, if you sustain it and let it go, that's when you get blisters. But you have to allow pain to be that uh, point of communication by God or your psyche telling you, you need to readjust, get a bigger fit, um, reschedule, do something different. So I would say, do not be afraid of pain. Um, when it does speak though, you need to start listening. And so tiredness will be uh, resolvable and rectifiable with rest. A burnout is rectifiable by healing and rescheduling and balancing. I love that differentiation. And I also want you to talk about uh, again, I mentioned two books that you wrote, uh, one you wrote on your own, one you wrote with Francis Chan and Larry Osborne called Sifted. Yes. Uh, do you see a difference between leading on empty and burnout uh, versus seasons of being sifted? Do you view them as the same? I'm just curious how you would do that. Yeah, one is an attack on your psyche and your health. The other is could be an attack on your ministry and to refine you. So one is for refinement and the other is, you, is for rescue. <laughs> and uh, so they're different. And uh, the Lord spoke to Simon Peter and said, I'm, I'm going to pray that your faith not fail when you're being sifted. And he doesn't say when you're burning out, I'll just pray that your faith not fail. You know, no, you, you make adjustments and, and bring in balance. So there's a big difference between sifting and burning out. Uh, I want to hear you talk a little bit more about your recovery process. And you talked about, you know, needing to delegate, needing to reprioritize, um, you, you're extremely practical in the book. And if you haven't read it and you're listening to this, please go and buy Leading on Empty. Uh, you give an entire game plan for it. But, uh, you know, you, you mentioned a personal retreat day, um, implementing a Sabbath. Can you just talk about some of the, the rhythms of rest? I believe you go away every summer for a month or two. Uh, now, what are some of those rhythms of rest you've implemented that have made a, a difference in, in this season of leadership? Yeah, one is I keep my disciplines. It, you know, you, you've got to be a master at the basics. And when I started burning out, Doug, I started to lose the basics. Uh, like Vince Lombardi, you know, when they lost the game, when they were playing, the legendary coach called the practice the next morning. And, and they should have won, but they, they lost it. And they lost it on the basics. So the next morning, he called his team players together and held up a football and said, we're going to start all over again. This is a football. And uh, sometimes we as Christians get involved with complexity and complicated ministry and strategy, analysis, et cetera. Uh, but really, we need to be professionals at the basics. And when you are, God really starts to bring in the rest for you. You don't do it. A lot of times we put our energy in doing what God should be doing, and we slack on what we should be. So one of the things I knew, knew I needed to do was get back to just daily devotions to make sure we do a thing called SOAP. 
where scripture observation application prayer and, and we use a life journal every morning i had to get back to that the second is to take sabbaths during the week uh, so now i take monday and fridays off so i'm doing this from home <clears throat> and uh because it's a, on a day that's my day off but uh I used to work five days a week and then preach on the weekends and keep right on going. And I can't do that. It's just too much. So I have to understand that I'm human and frail. I also now schedule uh, breaks. Just in fact, I was talking to my wife, Anna. I said, honey, we're going to get away five times a year. I don't care if we just go to a state park down the road and <laughs> put up a tent, but we've just got to get away. So we were planning that just the other night. And so we've got to schedule our away times uh, before I have to, because there's a big difference between isolation and solitude. And let me give you the definition of that. Isolation is, let's say this is a plus 10, and this is a zero on your energy scale, and this is a minus 10. A lot of times our energy goes down to a minus 10, and then we just got to get away from everybody. Just got to get away. I don't want to see people. So I isolate myself and I go from a negative 10 to a zero. And then I think, whew, I can get back into ministry now. But you're going in at a zero. <laughs> On the other hand, solitude is plus 12 and you're down to about an eight and you need to fill up. And so you get away, read some books, enjoy you know, what fills your tank. And you then come back at a 12. So that's called solitude. It's a planned getaway. And Jesus did that. It says an early, um, a long while before day, Jesus would go to the garden, spend time with his father. He wasn't at a minus 10. He just scheduled that in and he had a time of solitude to make him even stronger. Most of the time, Doug, we don't do solitude very well. We do isolation. Uh, I was... I paddle in carbon fiber canoes in the ocean. So I do ocean uh, sports. And uh, we were doing a race from the island called Molokai to Oahu. And it's over a big, uh, pretty rough channel. And it, this time was in a six man canoe, so fiberglass canoe. And six of us are paddling and we're racing with a hundred other boats. And we carry what we call a camelback. Uh, it's a backpack with water in it and has a tube that comes over here. And the coach said to me, Wayne, every 15 minutes, take a drink. And I said, but what if I'm not thirsty? He said, no, no, every 15 minutes, you're paddling hard, you take a drink. I said, but what if I'm not thirsty? I can keep going. And uh, because I have to grab the tube, put it in my mouth, take a drink and then keep paddling. I'm gonna lose two strokes, three strokes. And he said, every 15 minutes. And I said, why don't I just wait till I'm thirsty? And he said something I'll never forget. He said, Wayne, if you wait until you're thirsty before your drink, it's too late. Your body has already gone into dehydration and a drink will not redeem or restore that. It will start to deplete your system and you'll have lactic acid build up and you'll be done in an hour. Never forgotten that. And the same is true with isolation or solitude. If you're just waiting for isolation all the time, uh, it's too late. You're already going into spiritual dehydration. So learn the difference between solitude and isolation and get up there into this portion here and do what Jesus did. It'll keep us healthier. Uh, in the book, you mentioned your personal retreat day. And I thought this was extremely helpful. Can you share everyone what a personal retreat day is and what you do on it? Yeah, sometimes I'll, I'll do different things because, you know, um, always remember that consistency and variety are the secret to balance, consistency and variety. Uh, you want to do certain things consistently, but you have to make sure it stays various and, and colorful. So sometimes on my retreat day, I'll just take a book and uh, just maybe read the whole book and take time to underline and think. So when I'm done, I will have filled up a little bit. Sometimes I just go and get ahead, like with my sermon planning. I'll throw it out another two months and think through. And, and instead of just putting down titles and making it sound like it's you know interesting to people, I really pray over each of them. I just take more time. And when it's done, my heart is so much fuller 
because I did that. And those retreat days are, well, I tell you, they're worth their weight in gold. Thanks for sharing. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the book Sifted. Um, <laughs> it seems like uh, you shared a story in the book that a young man was, I think it might have been your son, was ready for ministry and just came out of Bible school all fired <laughs> up. And uh, he said, I'm ready. I think, was it your son? I'm yes. ready. I'm ready. And you said, no, you're not ready. Uh, you haven't suffered enough. <laughs> and uh, that's the thing of the whole book is basically we have to go through seasons of suffering in order to be influential and to be who God calls us to be. Do we really have to suffer? As yeah, Christian? No. You about this whole principle? Yeah, I wish. I wish we didn't have to. Uh, but, you know, uh, in the midst of suffering is when we start to grow. If you never suffer, you never grow. It's just like learning. Um, the only time you learn is when you lose. You know, if you're in a competition and you win, you learn squat. But if you lose, you say, you know, I got to do this. I got to change this. I got to do this. I got to practice more. So you only uh, learn at the valley floor, never at the mountaintop. So uh, Peter says it in this way. He says, and let those who suffer according to the will of God keep entrusting their souls to a faithful creator and doing what is right. In other words, he's saying, let those who suffer according to the will of God. If he says there's a way to suffer that's according to the will of God, He's probably inferring that there is a way to suffer that's not according to the will of God. It makes you harder, more contrary, a little bit more bitter, maybe prideful, and you don't learn anything from it. It just makes you a little crustier. But I've got to learn how to suffer according to the will of God and keep entrusting my soul to a faithful creator in doing what is right. So, yeah, when you suffer, you grow a lot. And we hate it. We hate it. We hate it. I wish God's goal for my life was convenience and comfort, but it isn't. It's likeness. And so suffering is sort of like when God is chiseling something out of your life, like if you're a sculptor and uh, when Michelangelo was sculpturing Peter, uh, he sculptured Peter out of this big, huge piece of granite. And when someone said, how did you know Peter was in that rock? Uh, or rather David was in, sorry, when David was in that rock. Michelangelo said, uh, I kind of didn't. I just started chipping away everything that wasn't David. And sometimes God's going to chip away stuff that's not Doug. It's not in the image of Christ. And it bleeds. But we've given God permission to do that. So however it comes, the chisel might be in the hand of a wife, a pastor, uh, a co-worker, an accident, and even a stupid mistake we make. But it's amazing who God puts that chisel in the hands of. And we have to make sure that we're looking at the chisel that God is guiding, not the messenger that's wielding it. So, so talk to someone in a season of sifting right now, whether it was, you know, God chiseling them through a spouse and just working on their character or even a mistake that they made. Um, seasons of sifting can be extremely difficult and can cause people to want to just throw in the towel and just say, this isn't worth it. What would your encouragement be to those people listening right now? Yeah, that's why Jesus said, Peter, I pray that your faith not fail. And once you have turned, strengthen your brethren. There's something about coming through a season of suffering that ratifies your ministry. Once you have come through it, strengthen your brethren. In other words, you got to go through suffering to certify that you're going to be someone that I can use to teach others. If you don't, you ain't. And so one is to help the person to see the other side of the sifting, to see what's on the other side, because often failure comes right before success <laughs> you know the darkest moment is right before the the leaf breaks the ground and becomes a shoot or a plant and sometimes we think we're done when we're just about to begin and the devil doug would love to get you to drop out right before victory is won that gives him the greatest taste of his cunning and his strategy and uh, right when it's the darkest get ready because god's about to break through in a wonderful new way in your life. One is to help them to see the overall picture. And the other is find a coach that can handhold them through it. If they're not a veteran, if they're an acolyte or an apprentice, uh, boy, I tell you, the greatest friend you would have during this time, Doug, would be to have someone kind of handhold you through it. So how are you feeling? What's going on? Here's what you do. And, and why? So your faith not fail. I can't do it for you but you can do it. And I'm going to encourage you all the way. And when you find a brother like that, 
uh, you found gold. Wow. Thank you for, for sharing that. Uh, a question that I'm starting to ask all the leaders that I interview um, that are seasoned in, in life and leadership is, can you just speak into each decade of life, something that you'd speak about leadership? So specifically 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, and beyond. Um, if you just had one word for each decade, what would you tell those leaders? Yeah, the first stage, Doug, in the 20s, I'd say gain life experience. Uh, don't worry about pay, salary, benefits. You got to have life experiences. You got to do everything from counseling to to preaching, to cutting wood, to setting up chairs, to sweeping the floor, cleaning toilets, get life experiences. Because really now at, I'm 68, uh, right now I basically uh, teach out of my life experiences because I just have hundreds and hundreds of them to draw from. At 20 years old, you have theories, you have concepts, you have ideologies. And we hear that there are dime a dozen out there. And we don't need to hear another one that's in the name of Jesus to give more certification authority to your voice. No, just, just, gain, just serve. The fastest way to leadership for a 20, 35-year-older is go through the servant's entrance. Be a servant. Serve. Uh, Elisha did that with Elijah. We have people that I'm interning that are 20, early 30s. They think they've gained everything they, they need to know about ministry and uh, you don't need to tell me because, uh, you know, this is my area of expertise. And it's like, get real. Uh, you don't have a clue. And so what happens is God takes them through a sifting, a mm -hmm. sifting of themselves. Ha they got to get that out of there and stay as a servant. Be, be grateful. And the second stage is start to um, experiment with uh, uh, what God has given to you. Uh, let's say... You can do 10 things. You can, you can do this. You can do youth ministry. You can play a guitar. You can sing. You can do this. But right, put those 10 things on a whiteboard and then ask yourself, what of these 10 things that I can do is God calling me to do with my whole life? Where's my base camp? Where's my home base? Is it playing the guitar? Does he want me to be a singer and a worship leader like Chris Tomlin for the rest of my life? Uh, or is that just part and parcel of my ministry, but not the home base of it? It's not my camp. It's not where I camp. Okay. So what about this? What is a missionary? I could do a, be a missionary and be a TV person. I could do this. Well, when I wrote all of those things down, I said, you know, where I land is being a shepherd, a pastor. I can do all of these other things, but this is where I'm going to B. And this is about 30 to 40 years old. You start to really zero in what God's calling is. So then when it comes to pastoring, anything with pastoring, preaching, counseling, et cetera, critical thinking, be bold in that area. These other things here, don't be so bold in, you know, uh, be a little bit more pensive. That stuff is optional, but what God's calling you to do, do it with all your heart and soul because that's what God is going to be watching you in. That's where he's going to gift you, provide for you, not in these other things over here. The devil will throw money out over here to get you distracted. And how many young men and young leaders are uh, distracted? And, uh, you know, we say it this way, Doug, what's worse? What would be worse than doing what God's called you to do somewhat poorly? is doing what God has not called you to do excellently. Wow. So if it's not what God's called you to do, but you are a stinking good guitar player and singer, but he's really calling you to be a preacher, you better make sure that you do this one well, even if you do this other one poorly and never mix them up. So that would be in the 30s. And then the 40s, I would say to them to start settling into... Uh, doing their leadership very, very well, uh, because by this time, you're going to need some refinement, some optimization. You got the basics down, wonderful. Don't lose the basics, but now you need to refine. You need to advance, and then by the time you're 50, start looking for disciples, and even if in the 40s you can do that, start discipling, discipling, because really, if you think about it, David's ministry, when he uh, had Solomon, David's greatest ministry would be in the next generation, not in his. 
he was to be now a veteran teacher, just like Moses on the hill with Aaron and her on one side. Joshua was in the valley fighting the Amalekites. It was like at about age 50, we need to make sure that we've got our hands lifted more than we are swinging a sword. And so at that point, I would say start discipling like crazy. Pour your life into young disciples and to pass that baton. I think when that happens, you'll have a full-orbed leadership career that I think God would smile at. Yeah, and you mentioned passing the baton. Uh, earlier in the interview, you talked about you had a few handoffs that didn't go well. Um, right. I'm just curious, any advice there? I, I know a lot of leaders uh, that are thinking about succession. Uh, any advice there for leaders in that season of life how, and how to pass the baton well and so that it doesn't end up how those three ended up? Yeah, you know, uh, it's a kind of a double-edged thing. On one hand, uh, I did have some drops on the baton, but if I had to do it over again, I would still believe in those people. Mm -hmm. I'd still believe in them. Uh, and because I don't ever want to get crusty and say it didn't work with those, you know, whatever generation it might be. I'm not working with them anymore. I, I, I would still believe in people. Because if you think about it, you know, in Matthew 13, in the parable of the sower and the seed, there was four different types of soil. Only one soil produced 30, 60, 100 fold. So if you look at it, it was a 25% success rate. <laughs> Three out of four didn't make it. And yet he has a parable that that's good. It's okay. But that one that made it bore fruit 30, 60, 100 fold. So I'm going to keep throwing seed out. And even if I make mistakes or uh, a baton pass doesn't work, I'm going to keep refining it and keep optimizing it. Just don't ever stop believing in people. Believe the best out of them. And whether or not they succeed, it's not your responsibility. Yours is to believe, disciple, and send. So good. Uh, in a minute, I want to dive into what I call the lightning round, just a bunch of fun questions for leaders. But um, I mentioned already, if you haven't gotten the books Leading on Empty and Sifted, I'd highly recommend those. And those are just two out of a dozen plus books that Wayne has written. So I'd encourage you to buy them all. But Wayne, is there anything else that you would leave leaders with today on these two subjects of Leading on Empty and being sifted before we dive into the lightning round? You know, one of the things I would say is make sure that uh, you have an uh, ongoing conversation because if you look at the internet now and all of the amazing resources that are available, uh, content is plentiful, conversation is rare. And what's happening is we're starting to exchange content for conversation. We're starting to uh, take resources over relationships. And that is a dangerous transition. It will unbalance the ship. It will make it very, very vulnerable to the waves that bash against your side because you're almost tipping at that point. Uh, so keep relationships open. Don't burn bridges. Find a group of uh, people that, and it could be only two or three, four or five, but that you can have open, serious, ferocious conversation with and they with you. It keeps you balanced, keeps you human, keeps your feet on the earth, even though we are citizens of heaven. Thank you. Uh, let's dive into the lightning round. And uh, the first question is, what is the best advice you'd ever received and who gave it to you? Wow. Um, I, I need to say my wife because she might be listening. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, one of the uh, pastors of many, many years ago uh, saw that I had different gifts in this area and that area. And he said something really neat. He said, Wayne, I believe in you and God's going to use you in a great way. And he said, but uh, I want you to make sure that you keep your humility strong and your pride de da uh, uh, in death, you know, just kill it. And so then God can take you a long way. Uh, the other one was not really a piece of advice, but it was really a an inspiration moment that kept me going for years. Uh, I remember in Bible college, I went into a classroom and uh, the professor said, now I'm three, three months old in the Lord. And all I knew was the New Testament and I'm in Bible college. And everyone was like saints and cherubim and seraphim in the class except me. And so the professor says, 
let's all turn to Jeremiah. I guess it was a devotional time. Let's all turn to Jeremiah. And I remember turning around thinking, who's Jeremiah? And so the kids started laughing at me. One of the kids said, in your Bible, stupid, in your Bible. And so I thought, man, I don't belong here. I'm not good enough for this college. And well, the next class was taught by a wonderful lady. And she started off by saying, what's your dreams? And one kid would say, worship leader, a pastor, a counselor. And then she would say, do you think Cindy could be a counselor? And we go, yeah, Cindy, yeah, you go get him, girl. And uh, Billy, you think he can be a good youth pastor? Oh, man, yeah, and we're cheering each other on. And, and then she, she uh, asked me, and we had conversation. And then she said, just write your dreams on a piece of paper. So we all did. And the next day, uh, after handing it in, we got it back. And it didn't have a grade on it, but it had in red a note from her. And this is what the note said. Wayne, I can see that the hand of God is on your life. And God is going to use you in great ways. She said, keep speaking, keep preaching, keep wanting to help people, keep believing in them. And then she ended it with this, Doug. She said, the kingdom of God has been waiting for you. I must have read that phrase 12 times before I went to bed that night. And uh, it stuck in my soul. And you know? I just, every time I wanted to quit, uh, her words rang back to me, and uh, she said, Wayne, the kingdom of God has been waiting for you. And that has been probably one of the greatest inspirational and defining moments that God used this lady to give me as a gift that would sustain me through the valleys of life. Wow. Do you still have that inside of curiosity, the piece of paper? No, I, I don't know where it is. I wish I had it. Yeah, that's an incredible story. Thank you for sharing. Um, if you could put a quote on a billboard for everyone to read, what would it say? Wow. Uh, stick with your wife. <laughs> you know, Doug, I see so many young ministers now falling and be, being terminated because of immorality. I mean, giants in the faith, you know who I'm talking about. They're, they're all over. And I'm thinking, oh, no, the kingdom needed people like you. And somehow we got too full of ourselves, or too busy in ministry and someone else looked better. Uh, and in fact, that's not an original thing. I was a Bible college student and his name was Pastor Dick Cook. He pastored three churches in Eastern Oregon, Christmas Valley, someplace else and someplace else, I can't remember. So we went to one church at eight o'clock and then we, he drove me to another church at noon after lunch, we drove to a third church and had an evening service, and he was what they call a circuit preacher, and they still have them today in areas that are very remote. And on the way home, after uh, being with him all day, and he'd been a pastor for 40 or 50 years, I said, Brother Cook, I said, uh, what's one thing you could tell me as a young leader? One thing, if you could sum your whole life up, what would it be? And I was waiting for this grand divine kind of injunction that would come and transform me into some saint or apostle and uh so he tapped the steering wheel and he said one thing kind of had a texas accent and i said one thing he turned to me and he said you're young un. i said yes i am sir and he said you're energetic i said yes i am well here it is stick with your wife and that was probably 40 years ago. Never forgotten that. Powerful. Uh, best purchase you've made in the last year for $100 or less? <laughs> oh, man, I don't know. Uh, I think I... Uh, uh, I, I bought a coffee grinder. <laughs> <laughs> so I can make really, see, I'm a coffee addict. If I could take coffee intravenously, I would. But uh, I love good coffee. And so I was buying, you know, beans and I mean, coffee. And I thought, no, I'm going to go one step further. I'm going to buy some really good beans and grind my own coffee and, and uh, drink that. So that was the good, good in fact, this, I have it right here. <laughs> <laughs> Um, when, uh, do you have a book or two, I'm sure you could list a thousand, but do you have a book or two that you always recommend to people that have impacted you the most? 
you know, so many, Doug, it, the, the just great authors out there and so many insights. Uh, and some of the older books are still fabulous. I, I like to recommend missionary biographies of Hudson Taylor, Jonathan Goforth, David Livingstone, um, Jim Elliott, uh, Amy Carmichael, Mother Teresa. So many of these are mentors that I call historical mentors. A lot of times contemporary mentors, uh, the uh, end of their story hasn't been written yet. And so if you lean on them too much and then something happens, it dashes your hopes. On the other hand, people like Billy Graham or Mother Teresa or some of those uh, from the past, John Wesley, all of those, their stories have been written and you know the end of their story. And so then you can say, that's kind of like, I'd like to example or model my life after. So the books that I read would be those kinds of books. And then of late, um, well, not of late, but uh, read a book on a Abraham Lincoln uh, called Team of Rivals. And uh, I've enjoyed that. Uh, so there's so many, but those are the ones that I would say, yeah, take a look at those that are more ancient books that uh, talk about missionaries who's whose faith did not fail when they were sifted. Um, what's your biggest leadership pet peeve? Pet peeve? Yeah. Uh, I think the, um, I'm so excited about the younger leaders coming up, those that are 30 and 40 years old and 20 somethings, uh, amazing. But um, my pet peeve is when they start to get too trendy and try to look more like the world than, uh, than, than heaven and that you can't tell them apart from the young celebrities and they almost revel in the fact that they are. And I thought, you know, we need to make sure that we're resembling people whose, whose greatest treasures are within and it's the purity of spirit. Even as Peter said to the young women, let it not be in the braiding of hair and the outer clothing, but let it be a gentle and quiet spirit in the heart. Uh, in fact, when Doug, when people say, Wayne, what do you look for when you hire people? Uh, character, competence, coolness, trend, um, are they good looking, uh, athletic? No, none of those. Uh, what do you look for? I look for the way they think. Uh, I watch the, how they think, how they solve problems, how they look at the world, how they interpret things that are going on in uh, current events, what's happening at the White House. And I just like to listen to how people uh, conjecture about it because it tells me how they think not only in things of the world, but the things of God. You've, you've gotten to spend time with some of the world's greatest leaders. And I'm just curious, when you get to spend time or have lunch or coffee with a great leader, do you have a go-to question that you always ask no matter what? I don't. I, I just want to absorb from them. I'm a sponge. And uh, you know, I know Bill Hybels kind of went sideways a little bit, but uh, I would spend three days with them. I'd fly out to Chicago and we just kick around and... I like his forcefulness. One of the times I was, we were driving in his car and he said, what do you think about? And I gave an answer and he paused for a second and he looked at me and he said, that's not a very good answer for a leader to give. <laughs> I said, okay, let me reword that. <laughs> but, uh, and then I've been with, you know, people like Tony Campolo or James McDonald or you know, some of those, we were on the elephant room with uh, T.D. Jakes and, and uh, Steve Furtick. And I like to just watch them and their human side. You have to be okay with their human side. Otherwise, um, you have a wrong concept of reality. Uh, everybody has a human side and it's flat. Even Elisha said, you know, I poured water on the hands of Elijah. Uh, 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 those that are commentators say, that means after he goes to the bathroom behind the bushes, Elisha washes Elijah's hands. Wow. And yet he respected him, yet he loved him, yet he served him. And uh, to me, that is one of the greatest assets of any up and coming leaders that when you see the flat spots of a veteran leader, does it make you disrespect them more, like them less? Or do you say, we all have a human side and I wanna see everything without condemning, without deprecating, I need to see it all. And didn't Paul say that? That I might know him in Philippians and the power of his resurrection. And it's almost like he stopped and paused and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death in order that I might attain to the resurrection of life. I thought that's how we need to see leaders. 
from the bottom to the top and respect them still. Amen. Now, this one, you, you live in Hawaii, which is a bucket list item for most people. <laughs> but is there anything you've crossed off your bucket list that you would say, if you've never done this in life, you have to do this? So what, what I would say you, they would have to do, yeah, you got to go to Hawaii, Doug. You know, it's, it's, it's on the way to heaven. I mean, it's, it's great. <laughs> but, um, no, I would say to each pastor or each leader, um, develop an avocation. And it's not a bucket list to any location, but it's an avocation where you, you spend time doing something other than ministry or leadership that it, whether it's woodworking or something and what it does is it actually clears your head so that you're better here don't get an avocation that distracts you from ministry get one that inspires you for ministry i ride horses and I, believe it or not i shoot 45 calibers i have a it's a, a called mounted shooting and so we run our horses as fast as they'll run and we shoot 10 targets or 10 balloons and we have five shells in each gun and it's just black powder. So there's no projectile. But when I'm riding my horse that fast and he's running 35 miles an hour and I'm trying to shoot things on both sides and running him through a pattern, you can't think of your sermon. You can't think of <laughs> a staff person that is bugging you. Uh, you better not because you would be one with the dirt. Uh, and I've flown off my horse several times, broken both legs. So, uh, it helps me to get my mind off of leadership and ministry to clear it, to give it rest. And then when I'm back in ministry, I'm ready to go again. So get uh, an avocation that you really, really enjoy and don't, don't go home to heaven till you do it. Wayne, this has been a rich conversation. Thank you so much for your time today. I know this is gonna add value to hundreds and thousands of leaders, so thank you. Uh, anything else you wanna leave us with? No, it's just an honor to be with you, Doug, and it's, uh, glad for what you're doing. Keep doing it because, as I said, content is plentiful today. Conversation is rare. We need people like you having face-to-face -face conversations, even if it's over Zoom. Let's keep doing it. Thank you, Wayne.